Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jum'a mubarak to you all, praying that this message finds you all in safety, comfort, and peace, especially if you had been experiencing uh, some of the adverse winter weather in Texas this past uh, week, or if you've been experiencing any kind of difficulty, uh, may Allah bestow peace, safety, and comfort upon you and your family, inshallah, this Jum'ah. We begin with the praise of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, in Ahmadu, and Astaina, who must offer who. When I would be lah in Sheru and Pusna, and say Yate Malina, Mayad Hilla, who fell a mudilla, who may you little who fell a hadiella, who I shadow la ilaha in the law, who had the who la shrikalahu, who I shadow and the Mohammed and Abdu who are Sulu, Sallah, who I name Salam. All praises due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's servant and messenger. All peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون O ye who believe be mindful of Allah be mindful of Allah and do not die except do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Again we begin in the name of Allah the most gracious and most merciful So we've been thinking about this this topic of uh, today, discussing this aspect of consistency as well as contentment. So, what, with respect to the actions that we do in this world and the subsequent effects that it has on our heart, and what contentment means. What are we content with? Um, what does consistency mean when it comes to our actions? And how does consistency lead to then contentment within our hearts? So, one of the companions of the Prophet, a notable companion by the name of Abu Dhar al Ghifari, uh, re reported that the Prophet Sallam had peace and blessings upon him had said that, Oh Abu Dhar, do you say that an abundance of possessions or uh, material wealth is wealth, is richness? And Abu Dhar said, I responded, Yes. And remember, Abu Dhar is someone who's an impoverished person. He's not a wealthy person. He's someone who uh, is, is kind of on the margins of society. So when the Prophet asked him this, of course, he's thinking about that, like, yeah, like, you know, is that not wealth? What, what else would that be? And the Prophet then says, Well, how about to the contrary? Do you say that then a lack of possessions is poverty? And Abu Dhar said, I responded, Yes. And the Prophet repeated this exchange three times. And then the Prophet said that Abu Dhar, Wealth is in the heart. Poverty is in the heart. Whoever is wealthy in the heart will not be harmed no matter what happens in the world. And whoever is impoverished in the heart will not be satisfied no matter how much they have gained in the world. Verily, they will only be harmed by the greed of their own soul. So thinking one in the sense that as the Prophet has echoed, not just in this hadith, but in another hadith that wealth, true wealth is not in having many possessions. True wealth is in the richness of the soul, in the contentment of the soul. And thinking not just in that aspect, what the Prophet is trying to convey from a spiritual sense, but to whom Prophet is conveying this to. He's conveying this to someone who does, uh, who is more, not in an ascetic sense, but someone who is more impoverished, someone who is destitute, someone who does not have the riches of this world or is not, you know, uh, amongst the, the highest social elites that are there, but someone who truly does uh, this experience, um, these, these uh you know, the basic deprivations of basic necessities and whatnot, someone who is on the margins. And he's conveying this to this person as well as a way of uplifting this person that when, when especially when in that space, we, we can relate this to anyone, that how the process has, has conveyed that when we look at someone, um, uh, when, when we have our certain possessions, when we have wealth, or when we are missing something, we oftentimes look to the person who has more than us, and we should reorient ourselves to look at the person who has less than us. And for folks like Abu Dhar al Khifari, who may not have many people to see, who don't have much less than he did, uh, or that he does, um, to, to be able to see the, the inward aspect of this, that the wealth that we might be told by the world or informed by society to go chase and to seek is not that which is like abundantly found around us. It's not that which is, you know, in, in gold, silver, platinum, bronze, whatever it may be, copper that's, you know, laced all around us or in paper money. Uh, but wealth is actually that which is within our heart. And so you can be the richest person in the world, but you can be impoverished in your heart. 
And you can be the most destitute person in the world, but you can be the most wealthy within your heart. And so this aspect of contentment comes with, the, with, with one kind of reorienting ourselves to be able to see that the, the things that we do, the material actions that we, uh, that we undergo, the statuses that we try to achieve, the wealth that we take in, um, the paychecks that we get paid, these things are not measures of wealth that these are measures of societal mark of wealth. Uh, but true wealth, true wealth in the eyes of Allah is that which is within oneself and is that which allows one to not feel dependent on their possessions. It's not feel, let someone feel that they will not be satisfied. Is that which actually allows one to feel content, feel satisfied with that whatever they have. Um, so oftentimes we find ourselves, how, how does this contentment then go into this aspect of action? So oftentimes we find ourselves comparing ourselves to other people, um, especially, you know, within the Muslim community from our various uh, cultures and backgrounds, whether you're South Asian, Arab, or coming from uh, Africa or East Asia, wherever you may be coming from, there's different cultural norms and cultural, um, you know, kind of uh, things that are that are kind of imparted uh, and, and sometimes stereotyped in a way, but sometimes they become normative in the culture. Uh, and, and oftentimes many of us may find ourselves comparing ourselves to others for a very long time, from the very get-go. Uh, we may look at other people with respect to their grades. We may look at other people with respect to then their cars. We look at them with respect to their degrees. We look at them with respect to their jobs, uh, their kids, their family, all these different things. And we keep this aspect of comparison alive. And we might think to ourselves that what I'm doing is not enough or what I'm uh, doing in terms of like my actions is not good enough or the job that I have is not as good. I might be, you know, just a, an office worker here and, and someone else is like a doctor. And so I'm not doing something as good or as meritorious as that, or I'm not saving any lives. They're saving people. So we, we constantly find ways to be able to kind of uh, knock down what, what things we, what we, what we offer and, and the, the people that we are, the work that we do. And we have the chance to kind of revisit that regardless of the work that we do, regardless of the space that we occupy, regardless of whatever it may be that we are doing, that even if we don't feel like we may contribute as much as this person, or we may not be doing the same kind of work as another person, in a spiritual way, within our own tradition, we have the same opportunity to be able to make uh, an impact, not only within ourselves, not only in the world here, but in the hereafter as anyone else that is there. And so when we think about not, not just this aspect of comparison, but we think about this, this other element that comes to it, that, that aspect of not being content. So the Prophet had said the person who is impoverished in their heart will not be satisfied no matter how much they have in the world. So if we aren't, if we are consistently comparing ourselves to other people or being told to compare ourselves and we get into this habit of just seeing that I don't have enough, I need to bring on more, I need to take on more, I need to do all this stuff. It says that we don't have, we're not, we may not be as content with what we do have within, within our hearts. And so uh, it's, it's a call for us to be able to examine a little bit of becoming content. And, and, and what it speaks to is that our heart may need to be a little bit more polished, that our heart is uh, currently shadowed by the, the appeal of what someone else may have. And so we have to undergo a bit of a purification process to get to the state of contentment, that, that our heart can really shine, our heart can really um, allow us to see the blessings that we do have. And in order to do that, we have to undergo a little bit of this purification, not just a little bit, we have to go under a process of this. But we have to recognize we're from a tradition that lifts up uh, not just just the quality, the quantity of different things, but the quality of them. Our tradition states that whosoever saves a life, it's as if they save the life of all of humanity, that it doesn't matter uh, in a sense that you can, you can, you know, bring all of, you can, you can stack the numbers as you would like, but the, the things that matter is in the values, is in the ethics, is in the intentionality, is in the honesty, the sincerity. It's, it's, it's what, that's what means, and that's what, uh, that's what underlies each of these things, not just the quantity of them. So you can be whoever you might be, um, doing whatever work you may be doing. You may be a service worker. You may be someone working in custodial services. You may be an office worker. You might be a doctor. You may be anybody from any kind of uh, socioeconomic status and whatnot, but your opportunity to access not just the levels of spiritual uh, ascendancy, but also that which is available in the hereafter is available for anybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status or whatever their background is, that Islam levels the playing field when it comes to being able to access these things. And what allows us to reach the heights of those? And those it comes down to this aspect of contentment and consistency. So contentment and being able to see that 
we don't need to compare ourselves to other people. We don't need to, it, it, but the, the world that we live in fuels that. The world that we live in gives us this kind of luster that says that, man, like the car I have is not as good or the job I have is not as good. The house I can buy or I can't buy is, is not as good as the other person. And uh, it's in this kind of a society, this kind of a space where we are told to chase the bag. We are told to do more and to, 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 to do better than someone else or to get something that's better than someone else, where our, where our tradition, where our spirituality, where our Islam can help us in seeing and finding that true contentment in a way that society continues to never maybe let us. It continues to kind of hold us uh, and, and, and appeal us by just kind of, you know, dangling whatever that lure is, and then it vanishes at certain points. But our spirituality tells us that whatever the state might be, whatever the world around us might be, if we find that true contentment within ourselves, we don't have to find it in the world kind of around us. But it doesn't mean that we just become ascetic and we forget the world that's there uh, because the process of it is actually in doing. And so when we think about how we can then go into a state or get to a state of contentment in our heart, we have to first and foremost acknowledge that we've got some work to do. Um, we've got some work to do in order to get content. We can't just shift our mindset that there is some process required because of the fact that that contentment in our, in our tradition comes from the heart. And if our heart is still restless, that it means we need to get, we need to start to put some polish to it, that, uh, our heart might be getting a little polluted. It might be getting a little cloudy. It may need to be brushed off and rinsed off and polished a little bit. And so we need to acknowledge that we have some work to do, and then we need to engage in the act of polishing or purifying. Uh, in the book, uh, the famous book, Purification of the Heart by Hamza Yusuf, which is a translation of a poem by Imam al-Mawlud, this polishing, he states, is, or this purification is not a state. You don't just you know, purify it and now you're purified. Um, this polishing, this purification is a ongoing process. It's not a state. You continue to purify, you continue to do these actions. And this is what our faith tells us, that we continue to do so. Our Prophet ﷺ would stand late at night in prayers to where his wife would ask him, why are you praying so much to where your feet are swollen? And he responds, that shall I not be a grateful servant? Um, that even though he knew he was forgiven, even though he knew these things, he, he would still put in the work for it. And if the Prophet ﷺ is doing this, knowing what the Prophet ﷺ is, uh, that this call to continue to, to work on oneself, what does it say for those of us who are the inheritors of this, who, who need it much more than he did? And so Imam al-Mawlud, states as well, who had, his poem had inspired uh, Purification of the Heart um, by Hamza Yusuf. He states that what, what is most beneficial for the purification of the heart, what is most beneficial to, to start that and to, to engage in it and to continually uh, engage in its purification are those actions and those acts that are done with consistency, even if they might be small. So there's a hadith of the Prophet that says that the best actions are those that are continuous, even if they are slight or if they're, if they're a minor um, in, in, in their you know, uh, outcome and whatnot. And uh, we see in uh, Surah Shura uh, in the Quran that uh, Allah says that only the one who comes to Allah with a sound and a pure heart will be the one who is uh, accepted for whom the gates of paradise will be open and for whom Jannah, Jannah will be an abode. Um, forever to come with a sound, a pure, a uh, content heart will be that person. And so uh, this qalbun salim that that you come to Allah with a sound and a pure heart. And how do we get to that space? How do we get to that that purifying, purified, sound and content heart? Um, Imam al Mulud says by engaging in actions that are consistent. And as our Prophet Sallam said, the ones even if they are minor, but they are consistent in their state. And these aren't just any acts. You know, it's not not just the minor things that are when we do in our uh, privilege and our comfort, it's like, oh, hey, I just did like a very small thing and whatnot. It's consistent, but it has no effect on your spirituality. It has no effect on maybe the world around in some way, shape or form, or it may cause some kind of a harm, or it may not do anything like it's me just putting my pencil from one side of the desk to the other. Um, it's does, it's not has any impact outside of that. But uh, to think about that, these are acts or deeds that are done that actually make our souls strive a little bit. It gives us a little bit of discomfort. It uh, requires some sacrifice. It requires some effort. It requires a little bit of doing that is consistent. And so we have uh, this aspect um, in, in our tradition in so many different ways. But uh, Imam al-Mulud also states that an Adam's weight of a high praiseworthy action from the heart 
is better than high mountains of external actions with no heart. So you can do all of the, you know, you can be someone who's involved in all these different charitable actions, all these different volunteerings and all these different things. But if your heart's not in it, if your intention is not in it, what there's not really that much benefit. But if you are doing something, even if it is just a minor thing, but you do it with utmost sincerity, utmost uh, heart and utmost, uh, you know, intentionality, that aspect is, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's praise is so much more than something that you can do for so long, but have no heart in it, or just do it because it's the sake of doing it. Um, and, and we have this aspect within our tradition that uh, you have this, uh, the sense that it's, it, it's about the quality, it's not about the quantity, um, that you have uh, in our tradition, a man who had removed a harmful object from the road, uh, who was forgiven, you have a woman who had given a drink to a thirsty dog and was forgiven of her sins, that, that all of the different things packed into that one thing that that action done with intention, done with sincerity, done with intentionality um, was better than maybe uh, an abundance of uh, volunteering, an abundance of these actions, but not done with any kind of a heart. Um, and we think about this aspect that, you know, the actions that are trying to our souls, the actions that are that require some kind of sacrifice, some kind of difficulty, some kind of striving, um, over those which are just, you know, just a convenience to us that, that, oh, hey, it's an easy action for me to do, so I'll do it, but it benefits nobody. And we see an example of this in the hadith of a man that the Prophet said that, uh, you know, he was, he was pointing out that this person is a man of Jannah. He had identified one of the Sahaba, uh, the, the Sahabia of, of, uh, of being a man of Jannah. And all the other Sahaba are like, what was what, this guy like? What, what is he doing that, that we're not doing? So one of the other uh, Sahaba, he fo follows him around. And so um, he follows this person. He sees that he does nothing out of the ordinary. He's, he does his regular Salah. He does all this different stuff. He's not doing anything, you know, extraordinary. And so um, he has this conversation. He said, what do you do that's different? Like, what, what, is, what is it? He was like, I don't do anything different. He said, but I go to sleep with a sound heart. Or I said, I say, I go to sleep and I'm not envious of anyone and I, I, I don't, I sleep with no dishonesty or no hate or anything towards anybody, um, you know, no, no malintent or anything like that. No negative thoughts about anybody. I go to sleep with that peace and, and uh, not envying anything and just go to sleep uh, in, in, in that peaceful state, thinking good of others and then just to go to sleep without any kind of, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, a negative uh, intention or posture or thought to anybody else. He went to sleep with a sound heart. And the process of said, this is a person who is a man of Jannah. And thinking about that aspect, consistently, this person would do that. He goes to bed, imagine what it takes. Like, you know, someone may have wronged you, someone angers you, someone does all these things, but to, at the end of the day, be able to get to a state where you either forgive those people or you just wash away that um, the negative emotions and whatever it may be to get to a space where you just feel at peace. And he consistently do that. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy task, especially if you've been rubbed the wrong way, if you've been at the product of some injustice, he gets to a space where he would just center himself. And this would require that sacrifice. It requires mental sacrifice, mental effort, mental striving to not lose all of the stuff, but to go to this place uh, and go to go sleep. But he, he would do this consistently. And this is someone the process and lifted up as a man of Jannah. We have another example just tangibly, especially with it being in February with uh, being Black History Month. It's very important to look at our tradition, not just to see and to find the highlights of how um, we can be a, a woke tradition by lifting up the humanity and lifting up the sacrifices of those of our Black uh, siblings who are Muslims and uh, of, of those companions and pious predecessors who are Black, uh, to kind of say like, look, Islam is also, you know, uh, is, is very much woke in the sense, no, this is this is very much uh, a, a aspect of our tradition that our, our Prophet ﷺ, our religion, prioritized and emphasized and lifted up those who were on the margins and those who were uh, who, who were marginalized by society as those who became the forerunners of faith. And one of them is a is a woman who uh, is oftentimes pushed to the margins. If you if you open up the the abridged version or uh, the summarized version of Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll find this, uh, this narration of this woman actually labeled under importance of sweeping the mosque or importance of cleaning the mosque. But you'll see the significance of the story and the story itself is so much more. Um, it was narrated from Abu Huraira that a black woman used to sweep the mosque. The Messenger of Allah noticed that she was missing and he asked about her after a few days and the people told him that she had died. And he asked, why did you not inform me? And it appears that as if they had treated her or her affairs of little account. And the Prophet in frustration uh, had, had said that, why didn't you tell me? 
And he said, take me to her grave. And they went, then showed him to her grave. He offered a funeral prayer for her. And uh, after he's asked to be led there, and he, he made this funeral prayer. And then he remarked, verily, the graves are full of darkness for the people who are dwelling inside. But Allah, the Almighty and the Glorious, illuminates them for their occupants by the reason of my prayer over them. So my prayer illuminates them for people. And so the significance is on so many levels, that this was a woman who would consistently uh, sweep the Prophet's mosque, would take care of the Prophet's mosque, would do all of these things for the Prophet Sallallahu mosque and, and sacrifice, but consistently be there. Not just that, but she's someone who would be on the margin. She was Black. She was uh, not a, a native resident of that space. You know, she's seen as someone on the outside, as someone of dark skin, um, and, and already doing a task that is seen as menial, that uh, a janitorial task, a custodial task. This is not someone who's like at the highest stations of society, but she's doing just this routine stuff. But uh, not just that, but the fact that she did that consistently. And uh, when she passed, the people who were there didn't think any much of her. It's like, oh, it's just like somebody who was cleaning the mosque. Let's, let's, uh, you know, just, just bury her. And, uh, you know, we would just kind of move on. And the Prophet said, no, like, no, like, well, take me to this person, not just because of the sacrifice, but because of the consistency of who this person was, the sacrifice that they're put in, and so many different things that are there. So whether you are a blue collar worker or someone who is highly educated with many titles, you know that Allah does not see your wealth. Allah does not see your status in this world as an indicator of what is to come in the hereafter. Um, or does Allah see the values that we've based on, that we've uh, put into these things? Rather, Allah shows us that uh, in the Quran that it is not any of these tangible things that, that reach Allah. It is the piety. It is the inward piety. It is the righteousness, the, the sound hearts, the purified hearts that reach Allah. So whether we speak English perfectly, whether we speak it broken, whether we're born here, whether we're immigrated, whether you have a college education or no education, or you have some worldly aspect that people say has superiority over another, um, none of that is what counts in the hereafter. None of that is what matters to Allah in the hereafter. In fact, those things which you have, which give you more privilege, that's what will uh, take away and give you a little bit more uh, of a uh, priority and a little bit more um, of a responsibility than any of these other things. And so it's your intention, it's your heart, it's your consistency. And so we want to become people who are consistent because as Imam al-Malu teaches, in order to get to a space that our hearts are clean, our hearts are sound, we want to do those actions which are consistent. We take, for example, this woman, this black woman who's cleaning the Prophet Sallallahu mosque, consistently cleaning it. We don't know any much about her. The Prophet Sallallahu was told about people when he would go pray over them after he would finish his prayer, don't pray over those people because they are hypocrites. They were doing different things. None of the sort came for this woman. That he prayed for this woman, her grave became illuminated, um, and 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 nothing else came in that sense. So it tells us that she was someone who was an honest person, a, a good person, but someone who was on the margins, someone who would just consistently sacrifice her time just to clean the Prophet's mosque. Yet that was what she would do. That was her contribution, and uh, her heart was sound in that sense, as far as we know. And it, her, the, the, the result is kind of speaks for itself in the process of advocating for her, the process of being there. So when we look at ourselves here, we don't need to look at the world that is around us. We don't need to look at what is there around us to, to say that we're not doing enough. You can do more than enough um, through what, whatever means we have, because the objective of it is that we want to get to a space where our hearts are content, our hearts are sound. And that won't happen until we find that what we need is within us ourselves, that what we what the tools are is, is has been with us and that we find something. It may push us to do a little bit, but we need to do something consistently, work on that. And, and consistently incorporate that, whether that might just be saying salam to somebody, helping somebody out, removing an object from a road, doing something that makes us work a little bit, but in its little consistent actions, it opens up doors for other people. It makes things uh, easier for other folks, and it makes things easier for us in a sense. So uh, doing something, finding an action that you can do that not just affects you, but affects somebody else. And inshallah, seeing how that not only opens up doors for other people, it opens a door for you. And gradually this polish not just goes into one spot of the heart, but it polishes the rest of the heart as well. We lift up, inshallah, in closing here, our brother who had just passed away, uh, Sayyid Ijaz, um, uh, our dear uncle Sayyid Ijaz, who passed away 
this aspect of consistency is something that he is uh, known for. He was someone who's consistent because we saw him always at the khutbah, always at the end of this khutbah, you would see him staying positive, giving a compliment to the khatib, always asking how others are doing, consistently doing something and, and, and being able to be in that space. We ask that Allah forgive him for any shortcomings and forgive, uh, forgive any of us here who took advantage of any time and, and didn't uh, be affected by that, that may Allah uh, make of ease for him uh, this uh, his current state and in, 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 uh, in, in the hereafter uh, and, and, and to bring comfort to his family, to bring comfort to those of us uh, who, who are around, inshallah. And uh, we also lift up prayers for uh, Sister Abira that uh, made Chef Shafa for a uh, recent debilitating injury uh, with multiple spinal fractures um, that may Allah heal you, may Allah heal uh, not just you from the inside, from the out and, and provide for you comfort and provide all for us all a shifa that, that may be, be protected from any of these injuries. But again, we lift up for us. What can we do consistently? What can we do to create contentment within our hearts? We start in that space where um, just even checking up on other people, just making dua for somebody, just praying for somebody, just checking up on that side, being like those Sayyid Ijaz uh, within our own context, our own neighborhoods, our own homes, be consistent, be positive, be people who are always there and who can help others and who can pray for others. And even if we don't have much to give, we might not have a lot to be able that we can do physically, just even saying a good word. Our Prophet Sussam said, smiling is a charity, doing something that requires you to push a little bit but brings an infinite amount of uh, benefit in the hereafter. So may Allah forgive all of those who have passed from among us, who have passed before us, give us the opportunities of our limited lifetimes to continue to do the good work that they did and to always be uh, continuing and improving and consistent worshipers of Allah and consistent doers of good deed. Ask Allah to allow us to leave this Jummah better than we came to it, to allow us to leave every place better than we entered it, uh, and to make from our sins and our mistakes the opportunities for repentance, for growth, and for purification and excellence, and to allow us to find the most small deed, the most consistent deed, uh, and to be able to do that continuously, and to forgive those who have passed to make them exemplars for those of us who, are, uh, who have come after them, and to allow their deeds to not go to waste, and to allow them to stay alive in our memories, uh, because as Allah teaches us that um, those who pass in the way of Allah do not think of them are dead, nay, they are living. And so uh, to be able to continue to do these actions as a way of keeping them alive in our memories. And we ask Allah to guide us all to the right path, the path of whom Allah has bestowed the favors and not those who have incurred Allah's displeasure. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahima wa ala ala Ibrahima in the kameen majid. And as our Prophet Ibrahim, our father Ibrahim said, our Lord accept this from us. And accept this service, this act from us. Indeed, you are all hearing. Allah. Rabbana taqabal minna. Inna ka antis samil alim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.